as a neuroscientist, when someone says, oh, no, we're only using, oh, 5 or 10 percent of the brain, what, what's actually going on? OK, so it doesn't quite work like that. No. So, so you've got, you know, you've got your, your brain. The, the emotional part is about the size of your clenched fist. And then the more logical systems are around that and about the same kind of width. But it's all systems and subsystems that have cascade effects with each other. It's not like this part of your brain is for reading and writing and that part of your brain is for vision. Or, um, so it may be that when you're sitting here interviewing as a very experienced person, you're accessing a 10% of your brain that's just honed into this being an expert at this task. But you can access all of your brain, but you don't need to all the time. So it's, it's really about maybe accessing parts that you don't use all the time to just increase your field of what you can do. Maybe using different parts of the brain at the same time together more often than we have to. And just really accessing all of the potential that you have because the brain is um, very energy efficient. That's what I was just going to ask, yeah. So it, it won't do that unless you kind of override it and say, but I want to bring in my creativity. I yes. want to bring in my curiosity. It's always going to conserve energy. Exactly. Um, so the things you're really good at, those are the easiest things for your brain to do. Right. So now let's talk about another myth, and that is, well, it's a shame what's happening because especially when you see little children that aren't having the best programming in their, their mm -hmm. youth. So it's a shame. It's all done by seven. We are who we are. That's when all the development happens. Myth. So let's go ahead and bust that myth. Mm -hmm. I love busting neuromyths. So yes. This is good. <laughs> um, so that there's a couple of things. We, we used to think that by the time you physically stop growing, so eight, roughly 18, that that's kind of when your brain is set. But a subset of that is that the things that you experience by the age of seven have the biggest impact on your personality and you know how you're triggered and how you respond to things for the rest of your emotional life. So it's not untrue that the longer a pathway has been in your brain, so neurons that fire together, wire together, right. the more you experience something, that becomes more entre an entrenched pathway in your brain. It's not untrue that the longer it's been there, the more subconsciously that will play out. But we don't talk about hard wiring anymore, we talk about soft wiring, mm -hmm. which means that even something that's been there for a very long time can be not undone, but overwritten. So I'm being very, very precise with my words here. Yes. Because I could just say, no, that's not true. I like true. the word overwritten. Yeah, exactly. To overwrite yeah. a program. Because you can't actually undo right. a pathway in your brain. But if you replace it with a new desired thought that's feeling, stronger, do, it, do so they compete? How does that they work? Co then? They compete. So the one that's been there for longer, that, this is why that myth comes about. Right. The one that's been there already is the energy efficient pathway. Mm -hmm. So there's two things that can overwrite that repetition and emotional intensity. Yes. So repetition we mm -hmm. can control quite easily. So let's say you have a belief that. Um, you were just like your grandmother. You know, these sorts of things that get said to people before the age of seven. If you repeatedly, every time that comes up, say to yourself, actually, I'm my own person. I may have elements that, you know, in, uh, resemble other people in my family, but I can be my own person. If you say that every day, 10 times a day, at some point that's gonna overwrite this belief that you held. The emotional intensity one is harder to create it's almost like it comes in the form of trauma oftentimes. Trauma or... Very surprise. Much. So surprise. Yes. I mean, traumatic... If you and I went through a traumatic incident together, let's say something suddenly happened in this building, mm -hmm. we would bond emotionally much more mm -hmm. than if we just did this interview and nothing went wrong. Right. Um, so it is... But, but what you can do is... And, you know, I know we're going to come on to talk about visualisation and mm -hmm. manifestation, is you can create an image that's very emotionally important to you about why you cannot continue the rest of your life believing that you're just a reincarnation of your grandmother and you've got no you know chance to be your own person or be different um so you could you know you could do that with visualization you could do it with journaling you so could... how can you how can you add emotion in without surprise and without trauma 
um, how do you wire the thought, you, you are not your grandma, you are mm -hmm. your own being. Mm -hmm. You repeat this every day to overwrite that mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. Are there other tools, mm -hmm. uh, frequencies, music, sound, whatever, that you can over dance, that you can overwrite it with while you're saying this? Yeah, so using any of your senses, we, we all know about the five senses, mm -hmm. um, but there are other senses too, like our temperature senses, thermoception, our mm -hmm. pain senses, nociception, and then my favorite one is interoception, which is your sense of the state of the physiology of the inside of your body. So for example, if you think about how do I feel when people compare me to my grandmother, you might get butterflies in your stomach or you might, you know, kind of get a closed feeling in your mm -hmm. throat or, you know, crawling on your skin. Acknowledging that too and sort of, you know, managing to soothe yourself to reverse those physical symptoms. But the biggest one I would say is that trauma and to some element, surprise is kind of in between on this spectrum of basic human right. emotions. You've seen it in the book. Mm -hmm. So mostly trauma pushes us into the stress side of those emotions. So it, it makes us feel things like fear, anger, shame, sadness, mm -hmm. disgust. Mm -hmm. And when we feel those emotions, we have higher levels of the stress hormone cortisol. And that affects the blood flow around the brain and it affects which brain pathways really come to the fore. So the ones that were put there by trauma. Mm -hmm. If you find ways to move yourself away from those emotions to love, to trust, to gratitude, to joy, then you allow oxytocin to flourish. And that's the bonding hormone. It makes you feel like you can lower your guard, you can take healthy risks. And that's a lifelong practice. You know, that can come through gratitude, it can come through journaling, mm -hmm. but it has to also come through when you feel triggered by your trauma, that you can say, I'm safe, I'm okay, that you can control your breathing, that you can try and move away from those emotions to the ones that you want to overwrite with. Right. Yeah.